Hi, David Mould here. The other day I was on the phone with somebody in Canada who asked me if I was going to issue a statement about Ted Wilson's re-election. I told him I didn't plan to, to which he pretty much said, after all that you have put out on the internet, how can you not say something? I guess that's the predicament I'm in now. In the run-up to the election, I said so much. Now I'm expected to say more. Well, here goes. These are my thoughts, both to Elder Wilson's re-election and to the sermon delivered at the General Conference session on Sabbath, July 11th, 2015. First, his re-election. Of course, it was pretty much expected. So how did I take it? In stride. You can catch a glimpse of this by looking at some of the comments made at our YouTube channel and our responses to them. Now let me warn you, not all who watch our videos are friends of our ministry. Based on comments I've received, I'm pretty sure some watch these videos in total shock. They cannot believe our ministry is still going forward. After all the blows we've taken over the years and all the efforts at wiping us out, we're still standing, and not just standing, but giving the trumpet perhaps the clearest sound we've been permitted to give in 40 years of ministry, to which all I can say is, to God be the glory. We'll get to some of the more uplifting responses shortly. For now, here are some of the others. One, this person identifies himself or herself as, well, Seventh Day Sabbath. And the person said, once upon a time, there was a woman who came down with leprosy for murmuring against God's anointed. Repent. That's what they said. Repent. I was to repent. How nice. The next one is from Freddie. I firmly don't really appreciate what you are doing. Please pray for each other and love one another in truth and in the spirit. The next one is from a person calling himself the meek. You need to humble yourself, Mr. Mould, or you will be humbled by God. Next, we'll hear from Ms. Jules. He had one word to describe me, possessed. Next is Nasani. The church has elected Pastor Ted Wilson again. It's time you humble yourselves and not be critical of the servant of the Lord. The Muslims and Hindus need your voice and energy so they may have eternal life in Jesus. Of course, I wholeheartedly agree with the latter part of that comment. The Muslims and Hindus certainly need our voices and energy, and they will get both, I believe, before this battle is over. Next is Jeremiah Sepolen. Where is Christ in this video? I'm sure the Jesuits are laughing. They didn't have to infiltrate our church. We divided ourselves and gave them credit. Here is this person, Miss Jules, again. And somehow I think that Z may be silent, you know, but anyway. Everybody loves him. So you, my friend, can take this demeaning video and shove it up your... Ha, 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 whole string of ha, 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 Next, he said, we fasted and prayed just as you advised. And guess what? He rules. Ha, 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 Shove it up my what? How Christian. Makungu said 90% voted for Elder Ted Wilson. Amen. The next one is from somebody who identifies him or herself as MXKT77. Oops. 48 minutes of wasted time. How many souls can we contact in 48 minutes? A few, at least. Anyway, Ted was re-elected. This video reminds me of my beloved mother. No girl, even if it was the daughter of Ted Wilson, would be enough for her son, me. LOL. Laugh out loud. Man, even Jesus didn't please everybody. But it wasn't all caustic. Let's turn the page. This comment was from Eloquescence. Thank you for that blessed presentation, Elder Mould. May the Lord continue to bless your ministry. Eye-opening testimony was presented here today. Another gentleman by the name of David Robles.
he wrote, and I've deleted part of his comment, it was a bit too complimentary, but he said, David, you beautiful, fearless little shepherd boy, sling that stone. This uncircumcised Philistine shall be as the lion and the bear. It seems so many in our own denomination don't even understand our message. You understand. Sling that stone and the Lord be with you. We also heard from Roy Martin. Quote, I enjoyed this and well worth watching. R-O-B-Y-E-K-E -E said, very interesting. Latricia Fisher said, keep barking. And just last night, this came in from Monica. Brother Mould, keep shining for Jesus, for you were created for such a time as this. Wow. JSL wrote, take courage in the quotation from Winston Churchill, and firmer trust in Almighty God, your Father, who has called you for this hour. Rick Shaw wrote, I'm so glad I found you on YouTube, David. What profound insights on topics that really matter. I also had some rebuttals to some of the negatives one. Let's go back up to the one who used leprosy in his comment. Remember now, the comment was, once upon a time, there was a woman who came down with leprosy for murmuring against God's anointed. Repent. To which I responded, once upon a time there was a high priest named Eli who earned the disapproval of God and died because he kept his mouth shut when he should have opened it. Okay? And to the person who saw the video as 48 minutes of wasted time, we had quite a little chit chat. First, my response. So you would see a scam in the church and remain dutifully quiet about it? Sorry, I'm not wired that way. Next to the Bible, the great controversy opened my eyes like no other book on earth. It is too dear to me for me to remain silent while this travesty, the great hope, is paraded around as a substitute. Treason is treason, no matter who performs it. Loyalty to God, how few know what it is. He then wrote me back and said this, Dear David, you do know the advice of Gamaliel to the Sanhedrin, don't you? Yes, I do. God is the leader and head of his church, not Ted Wilson or any other man or woman. If he was chosen by majority, it is our role to accept it. If it isn't God's will, himself will lead things in a different path. God doesn't sleep, my friend. To which I gave my final response for the morning. Did I say I didn't accept this election result? Don't put words in my mouth. If you listen carefully to what was said on the video, you will hear these words. Quote, you know the real tragedy of all this? As disappointed as I am with Elder Wilson's actions, I don't know if anyone else would or could do any better. That's how hamstrung I believe any elected official would be to the compromised committees behind the scenes that are truly running this church. And I continued, my anger goes way beyond Elder Wilson. It is directed mostly to the committees that have hamstrung the man and that will hamstring any elected official. I am convinced that at the highest levels, God's church is being run by devils or cowards at best, who will not lift a finger to expose the abominations of the Roman Catholic Church before the world, which is our solemn duty. As for the stance that this is God's church, which it is, and that I should therefore remain silent in the face of her ongoing treason, I cannot close without quoting this statement from Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 49. Quote, and Mrs. White writes, although there are evils existing in the church and will be until the end of the world, the church in these last days is to be the light of the world that is polluted and demoralized by sin. The church, enfeebled and defective, needing to be reproved, warned and counseled is the only object on earth upon which Christ bestows his supreme regard. 
Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 49. Please note the words, needing to be reproved, warned, and counseled. Though misunderstood and misjudged in the process of producing these videos, that is precisely what I'm endeavoring to do. That is, to reprove, warn, and counsel. If in these videos I have opened my mouth without sufficiently substantiating the things I say, with ample statements from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, then please forgive me. I am doing my best. May God bless you, sir. And thanks for the comments. At least you went through those 48 minutes. Time will tell. But I do not believe it was wasted time, as you put it. Those 48 minutes got you to think, didn't they? That pretty much sums up the back and forth that occurred in the wake of this video, should Ted Wilson be re-elected. I have one or two more letters to share with you, but I'll do it a little later. The key point for me is the point made in the last comment about no elected official being able to do better. That's where I stand. So no, I am neither disappointed nor elated over Ted Wilson's election. If there is any disappointment, it will be over his continuing silence regarding refunds to those who feel defrauded because their funds were diverted without their permission from the great controversy to the great hope. I should tell you here that there was more much more we could have done in San Antonio to make the case for refunds. We could have printed t-shirts with the phrase, stop the fraud on one side and a picture of the great hope on the other, but we didn't. Knowing the general conference's fear of the press, we could have gone to several news outlets with our complaint, just as was done by the church's former chief auditor a decade or so ago, but we didn't. I felt what we did in the run-up to San Antonio was sufficient for this round of the struggle. There will be other battles, other forums in which to present our case for refunds. I'm pretty sure of it. We'll see how God directs then. All right. Have I answered sufficiently the question, what is my response to Elder Wilson's re-election? Let me repeat. I am neither despondent nor elated over his re-election. For as I said in the video that generated most of these YouTube responses, I see Ted Wilson as a puppet to the compromised committees that are running this church behind the scenes. Elder Wilson, by his continuing unwillingness to tell the rank and file members of the church why he switched books in midstream, is only part of the problem. The bigger issue by far are the committees to which he is being absolutely loyal. I hope I have made myself clear. Now on to Elder Wilson's sermon. As I stated five years ago, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is God's remnant movement, made up of those who, according to Revelation 12, 17, keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And we are on a heaven-directed journey. We must go forward, not backward, because we are almost home. I'm more convinced than ever before that Jesus' return is near, even at the door. Three times. In the last chapter of the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, verses 7, 12, and 20, Jesus himself says, I am coming quickly. Lord, we want to go home. We want to cross over the Jordan River to the promised land as we prepare to cross the Jordan don't retreat. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan. Go over this Jordan. Don't 
retreat, cross the Jordan. Joshua and the children of Israel were not to be discouraged or to retreat. Stay in the middle of God's will, cross the Jordan, and don't retreat. Brothers and sisters, cross the Jordan. Don't retreat. To cross the Jordan and don't retreat. Take up God's command. Cross the Jordan. Don't retreat. Take up God's command. Cross the Jordan. Don't retreat. Husbands and wives and families, take up God's command. Cross the Jordan. Don't retreat. My fellow brothers and sisters and church members here in this dome and those watching worldwide, do not be discouraged as you march toward the crossing of the Jordan. We are nearing home. We are almost there. Jesus is coming soon. What a day that will be. Cross the Jordan. Don't retreat into disbelief and cynicism. Cross the Jordan. Don't retreat into legalism, mysticism, superficiality, or meaningless emotionalism. Cross the Jordan. Don't retreat. Cross the Jordan. Don't retreat into skepticism, higher criticism, fanaticism, or formalism. We will figuratively cross the Jordan to begin the final journey through space to enter the promised land in heaven. We will cross the Jordan and go to heaven to be with him forever. As we commit ourselves into the hands of Jesus, our almighty captain, he will lead us across the Jordan and into the promised land. Lord, we long to be with you. Take us across the Jordan into the promised land. We long to be in heaven soon. As far as his sermon goes, I agree with him. We're headed for the Jordan and we should neither look back nor become distracted. Although I should point out what is a distraction to one could be life and death for another. In short, while going forward, we should leave room for divergence of opinions within the church. For example, to me, the issuing of refunds to those whom the church has defrauded is no diversion. A serious wrong was done to an untold number of people, a wrong which absolutely demands redress. Others don't see it that way. Evidently, Ted Wilson doesn't. I certainly don't hate anybody because of it, nor should you. So let's continue with the metaphor used by Elder Wilson in his sermon, that is, the crossing of the Jordan. We should remember what 10 of the 12 spies pointed out 40 years before Israel came again to the Jordan. That is, that there are giants in the land. Here it is in Numbers 16. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. So we were in their sight. Numbers 13, 33. What am I saying? If we're truly serious about crossing the Jordan, then like Israel of old, we'd better be prepared for war. We're not just going to waltz into the kingdom in the wake of nice fuzzy sermons or even that mass choir which I thoroughly enjoy. As the Apostle Paul put it, we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. That's Acts 14, 22. Here's the passage in its entirety. I'll put it up on your screen. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up, and came into the city and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe and when they had preached the gospel to that city 
and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Acts 14, 19 to 22. Paul had just been stoned when either he uttered these words or Dr. Luke uttered them, I'm not sure, when they about entering the kingdom through much tribulation. So what am I saying? If we're going to use the metaphor of crossing the Jordan, then we'd better prepare God's people for war, for Jericho, for Ai, for the Amorites, for Adonizek, king of Jerusalem, for Hoham, king of Hebron, and Piram, king of Jarmuth. That's Joshua 10, by the way. Having said that, I have now got to ask. Did you hear any talk about war in Elder Wilson's sermon? Did you hear anything that reminded you of Paul being stoned? Did you hear anything about any plans for facing up to the giant whose shadow now looms large in front of us. I'm referring to the Pope of Rome. I said, did you hear anything that even remotely sounded like a plan for meeting Goliath? The Pope will be addressing Congress on September 24th. So let me ask again. Did you hear anything about any plans the church might have for countering the Pope's message. In Elder Wilson's sermon, did you hear anything about arousing the people to resist the papacy? Nothing. You heard about Jordan, as if we're just going to waltz over these waters into the promised land. But did you hear anything about being prepared for the war that precedes Jordan? The largest possible stage for the General Conference President. Over 50,000 in attendance and no doubt millions more watching via satellite and the internet. And Elder Wilson says nothing about the war that's staring us in our faces. He says nothing about the Pope of Rome. As though he didn't exist. As though his recent encyclical Laudato Si with Sunday observance buried in it was never published. Recently, we got the following email. It is from a man who used to support our ministry. As long as I don't identify him, I don't believe he'll mind my telling you that he is a man who over the years has literally given millions of dollars to God's work. Listen to what he said in his email. Quote, Until recently, I wasn't interested in watching should Ted Wilson be impeached. Because I am a fan of his. But I finally watched them and was pleased to find that they were not as negative toward him as I expected. In fact, I thought your presentations in that series and all the other recent presentations were clear, engaging, and on target. I agree. That even as the great controversy is being dramatically fulfilled, too little is being said about it among Seventh-day Adventists. You know, he went on to say this. Many years ago, I strongly supported why Protestant, why Catholic, and what's behind the New World Order. So I believed then, and still do, that there is a role for excerpts of great controversy. I assumed that the great hope was similar, contiguous, full chapters. Now, in the last few days, prompted by your strong criticism of the great hope, I looked at it more carefully and found that it was a cut and paste job that eradicated the third angel's message. This discovery made me much more sympathetic with your passion against the great hope and the false impression given by promoters that it contained the message of the great controversy. End quote. Though I'd been praying for 22 years 
that the Lord would bring him back to us. I was still in shock when his first email came. When I rushed in to wake up my wife to tell her about it, this was there, there, there was a, a long silence. And I finally said, Joanne, did you hear what I just said? To which she replied, yes, but I was waiting for you to tell me you were joking. Listen, for 22 years, this brother had heard all that demons and men could throw at him about David Mould. On top of this, we'd had our private run-ins or disagreements, so he knew me personally. Yet here he was, an avowed fan of Ted Wilson. His words, a fan, agreeing with us that too little is being said by the leadership of this church about the Antichrist. That is so, so profound. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. If I didn't know it before, I certainly know it now. Those messages on YouTube have not been wasted messages. If I've told you about his email, then I might as well tell, tell you about another one. I'm going to take a little detour, okay? It's from another brother, one whom we haven't even met yet but who clearly loves the Lord and the mission field. Because he wrote me and told me about a particular mission trip that he had taken and sent me some pictures. He also supports our ministry. This came in a week or so ago. I have a question. I am considering buying a small plane. Do you think it would be an asset to the ministry to have a small plane available? The question left me in shock and I responded in kind. I told him, I confess, the thought of having access to a small plane has never crossed my mind. I should also confess that with the exception of our mission trips to Jamaica and one or two filming expeditions, I've become pretty much of a house mouse, hardly going anywhere. I believe you get my drift this morning. While I may be catching hell, from some who see me as the devil himself and have said so in their comments at YouTube. Others are responding with just the opposite sentiment. I really don't know what plans God has for our ministry, but that's not our subject today. Let me get back to the point, Elder Wilson and his sermon. Bottom line, I'm not so much interested in what Elder Wilson said in his sermon at San Antonio as I am by what he didn't say. And what he didn't say speaks volumes. He said nothing about war. I'm guessing now as to why. And it's probably not only because it is politically incorrect to do so. But because he knows we aren't prepared for war as a church. To my mind this evasion of the obvious is an abdication of the church's sacred duty. Because like it or not God's people are headed for war. One can stick one's head in the sand and pretend we don't see Goliath's shadow looming over the horizon. But that won't make Goliath go away. Beloved, let me give you two duties that have been specifically pointed out to us as we head down the home stretch. That's my metaphor. That's Cayman as Park in me coming out. Two duties that should have been hammered home to us at San Antonio. Elder Wilson didn't tell you so God had to scrape the bottom of the barrel, then pour the blood of his son all over my filthy garments, then put his Holy Spirit in my heart and mouth and mind, then bid me tell you what Elder Wilson and the General Conference wouldn't tell you at San Antonio. In addition to overcoming all sin in our lives, here is where we as a people should be focusing now, today, before the Pope ever sets foot in Congress. Quote, In the very time in which we live, the Lord has called his people and has given them a message to bear. He has called them to expose the wickedness of the man of sin who has made the Sunday law a distinctive power, who has thought to change times and laws, and to oppress the people of God who stand firmly to honor him 
by keeping the only true Sabbath, the Sabbath of creation, as holy unto the Lord. That's Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 118, and that was written, by the way, in 1903. That's our first duty, to expose to the world the wickedness of the man of sin. Not just to expose the man of sin, but to expose his wickedness. It's got to be done in love and much tact, but it's got to be done. The wickedness of Roman Catholicism must be revealed across our planet. Now here's the second duty. Protestants have tampered with and patronized popery. They have made compromises and concessions which papists themselves are surprised to see and fail to understand. Men are closing their eyes to the real character of Romanism and the dangers to be apprehended from her supremacy. The people need to be aroused to resist the advances of this most dangerous foe to civil and religious liberty. That's Great Controversy, page 566. So back to Elder Wilson's sermon. Did you hear anything about the wickedness of the papacy? Did you hear anything about arousing the people to resist the papacy? What you did here was an appeal for funds to help out in a building project in Vietnam. Be thankful for the churches you worship in. We do not own a single church building in Hanoi and have only a small number of believers in that great city of about seven million people. The Southern Asia Pacific Division, the Southeast Asia Union, the Vietnam Mission and the General Conference and others have plans to see God's work established in a stronger way in that major capital city. If there is someone someone listening or viewing, someone in this dome who would like to assist in some way, please contact the Southern Asia Pacific Division or our office. Now, I'm not demeaning this need over in Vietnam. In fact, I'd like to go there someday. But what I'd like to point out, especially to those of you watching over in Vietnam, is that the General Conference is literally sitting on billions of dollars of accumulated tithe, some of which could be immediately turned loose in Vietnam, or Afghanistan, or Haiti, or Sudan. But no, in the DNA of the General Conference is the tried and proven methodology of turning to the people, the masses, the rank and file of the church, the laity, you and I, for money. Never mind that the church is sitting on billions of dollars. It's got to turn to the cash cow. That's us for more. You know, I'm reminded of Martin Luther addressing this problem back in his day. Hello. We are am the Rathaus. Am When the Pope sent his indulgence mongers across Europe with those blasphemous certificates of pardon, pardon that the faithful believed they could purchase or buy with money, it was a grand Vatican money-grabbing scheme for the purpose of raising money to build St. Peter's Basilica. We address this in our One Day to Be Completed book, Outcast. It's online. You can read a few chapters of it at our website. I use this term, One Day to Be Completed, because this book has been on the shelf for quite a while, unpublished. And I don't intend finishing it 
or publishing it until after we've launched what I believe is God's challenge to Islam. I want that to be in the book. And you haven't heard me talk about it for a while, but it's still very much on our agenda. Anyway, in this book is the following quotation, and I'm referring to Outcast. In this book, there's the following quotation about Luther and Tetzel and thesis number 86. Here's the quote. At this point, I can't help but think of Luther's reaction to the Pope's pardon monger, Tetzel, who in 1517 ventured a little too near to Wittenberg with his worthless indulgences. Exploding in anger, nothing wrong with anger, exploding in anger, Luther posted his objections in the form of 95 theses on the castle church door, little dreaming his protest would spark the greatest revival and reformation since Pentecost. Among them is thesis number 86. I bet you never heard that spoken about most of us in the Seventh-day Adventist church. We talk about Luther and we idolize Luther posting his thesis. But let's pause and look at thesis number 86 of the 95. Knowing that the money from the sale of these indulgences was to fund the construction of the ornate St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. A task that took 120 years to complete. Luther put pen to paper and wrote, Why does the Pope whose wealth today is greater than the wealth of the richest Crassus, build the Basilica of St. Peter with the money of poor believers rather than with his own money. If Mrs. White could protest the inadequate pay being received by women whose work she deemed just as essential as the ministers, can you not see her? In response to the hoarding at the general conference, especially its unwillingness to spend its own money in printing the great controversy. Could you not see her unleashing the following? Why does the general conference, she would probably say, whose wealth today likewise evokes memories of Crassus, that's a reference to Marcus Licinius Crassus, the wealthiest man in Roman history and perhaps the richest man in all history, place the publication of the great controversy on the backs of its members instead of pulling from its own vast hoarded resources to publish it by the millions does not this reticence put the lie to the claim that what we really desire is a wide distribution of this book revival brother ted i'll tell you how you can have a revival lay open the secret vaults of the general conference Speak directly to God's people about this issue. Do your part in turning God's resources loose that his people can purchase the ships and the aircraft and the tanks necessary for the battle in our faces. Of these indulgences, Mrs. White echoes historians who tell us, quote, every sin had its price and men were granted free license for crime." If the treasury of the church was kept well filled. That's the great controversy, page 178. Now let me ask you a question. Does that sound like a church to you? Does that sound like a church that would sell forgiveness for money? That is not a church. That's something else. That is the Antichrist. No part of Christianity in there. But what did Mrs. White mean by every sin had its price? I'll tell you. In the diabolic system of indulgences that prevailed for centuries in the Roman Catholic Church, if you wanted to escape the penalties of purgatory for, let's say, the theft of somebody's horse, you could pay a certain amount of money. Adultery had a different price. So did murder, etc., in this book in my hands, Vicars of Christ, The Dark Side of the Papacy, on page 116 we find the following. The Roman Chancery published a book with precise sums to be paid for various absolutions. A deacon guilty of murder could be absolved for 20 crowns. A bishop or abbot who had 
assassinated a foe could be absolved for 300 livras. The wickedest crime had its price tag. And on page 101, Sixtus, that's Pope Sixtus, was the first pope to license the brothels of Rome. They brought him in 30,000 ducats a year. He also gained considerably from a tax imposed on priests who kept a mistress. Another source of income was granting privileges to rich men to enable them to solace certain matrons in the absence of their husbands. It was in the area of indulgences that Sixtus showed a touch of genius. He was the first pontiff to decide that they could be applied to the dead. Even he was overwhelmed by their popularity. Here was an infinite source of revenue that even his greediest predecessors had not dreamed of. It was breathtaking in its implications. The Pope, creature of flesh and blood, had power over the regions of the dead. Souls in torment for their misdemeanors could be released by his word, provided their pious relatives dipped into their pockets. And which of them wouldn't if they had a spark of Christian decency? Widows and widowers, bereaved parents, spent their all trying to get their loved ones out of purgatory. Praying for the dead was one thing. Paying for them, another. Simple folk were led to believe that the Pope or those who came to their village and sold the Pope's pardon, guaranteed their dead would go to heaven on the wings of indulgences. Remember now, the author of this book, Peter de Rosa, is a Roman Catholic historian. You know, I should tell you before I go any further, I had a friend, actually he was one of my staff members, who told me he grew up Catholic, that he was taught, he was given a, an item called a scapula, and he was to wear it constantly. He said he even bathed in it. Because the church told him that if he died with the scapula on, he would go straight to heaven. That's what he told me. And many Catholics apparently here in this country in the 20th century and 21st probably still wear scapulas. All right. But back to De Rosa. Purgatory, he said, had no justification. Whether in scripture or in logic. Its real basis was papal avarice or greed. An Englishman, Simon Fish, in a supplication for the beggars, written in the year 1529, was to point out irrefutably, quote, there is not one word spoken of it in all Holy Scripture. That's purgatory. And also, if the Pope with his pardons may for money deliver one soul hence he may deliver him as well without money if he may deliver one he may deliver a thousand if he may deliver a thousand he may deliver them all and so destroy purgatory and then he is a cruel tyrant without all charity if he keep them there in prison and in pain till men will give him money here, beloved, is evidence of the wickedness of the man of sin that needs to be exposed. In Catholic dogma, purgatory still exists. So do indulgences. It's good to know about your grandfather's Bible, Brother Ted, and your father's Bible, and your penchant for losing Bibles. It's good to know about all of that. But wouldn't it have been more appropriate, considering the time in which we live, to have spent some time telling us what those Bibles have to say about the Antichrist. With the Pope headed for Congress in September. Wouldn't it have been even a teeny weeny bit appropriate to remind us. What God's servant whom we are now told is no longer authoritative in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I said wouldn't it have been even a teeny weeny bit appropriate to remind us what God's servant had to say about arousing the masses to resist the advances of the papacy? Couldn't we even have heard from you in your sermon a word about that? Jack 
that my American forebears have for so many generations played their part in the life of the United States, and that here I am, an Englishman, welcomed in your midst, makes this experience one of the most moving and thrilling in my life, which is already long and has not been entirely uneventful. I, I, wish, I wish indeed that my mother, whose uh, memory I cherish across the veil of years, could have been here to see. By the way, uh, I cannot help but reflecting that if my father had been uh, American and my mother British, <coughs> instead of the other way around, uh, I might have got here on my own. 